Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. I hope you're well. Thank you so much for taking time to join us this evening. We've got around 115 on. We have around 350 signups, so we're going to give a few people a bit of extra time to get on. There's about 30 or 40 on the website right now trying to sign in, so I'm going to give them a few minutes. I hope you guys are good. How was your day? Just want to welcome my wife, Dr. Pooja Aurora, to the webinar as well for the, for you, it's the first time that she's come on to one of our webinars. Hi, good evening, everyone. Look forward to starting my debut webinar. So please do fire in questions to us. We want to try and help you as much as we can. It's slightly different to the webinars we've been doing over the last few weeks. If you guys have been joining us for our AKT lockdown webinars, then please let us know. Let us know if you've been on all summer with us, or please let us know if it's your very first webinar as well. I can see some names that I recognize, some names that are, I think, for, for the first time as well. So please do let us know. Right. So most people. I think are on board. Some of you guys have been saying you've been with us for a while, which is great. Probably getting used to my voice. By the way, we've got to mention, because both of us are doing this webinar right now, if one of our little ones wakes up, we may need to go and sort them out. So apologies in advance. But um, yeah, the realities of technology as a family. Right. So I think most people are on board. But before we go, can I just find out who we've got on tonight? Just let me know if you are a GP. GP trainee, starting to think about general practice. Who have we got? What's the audience so we can try and gauge this? So a lot of ST3s, uh, ST2s, a couple of people, newly qualified GP, congratulations. ST3 finishing soon, finishing soon. ST2 awaiting RCA results. Okay, so it looks like the majority are ST3s, but we do have some ST2s and some ST1s who are, who are clocking in, which is great. You're thinking ahead. And some people who have started um, working as a GP recently. So hopefully we'll try and tailor it to be of value to you guys. So if you want people coming on board, so I'm going to give them another few minutes just to get going. But where are you guys based? Whereabouts in the UK are you? Please let us know. Let's see where we're representing at the moment. Wessex, South Wales, Solihull. Excellent Solihull right next to us. Walsall, Oxford, Lincoln, Wolverhampton, South London, Bedford, Warwickshire, Blackpool, Worcester, Bournemouth, Northwest London, Covent, Warwick, Portland. Okay, so all over, all over the UK. So the chat, yes, we don't, um, the chat, I don't think you guys can see the chat. Hey, so how are you doing? Um, just because it distracts. So we'll go through and try and answer questions as we go. So please do ask questions as we are. If we miss questions as we go through the webinar, just to keep the flow going, we will go back at the end and make sure we answer all of your questions individually. So I think most people are on. There are people still trying to get on, but I think we're going to start. And let's try and see what we're going to cover then. So like we said, we're going to talk a little bit about the things that I wish I knew before CCT. I became a GP in 2010. Pooja, you? Yeah, 2000 and 15. Oh, gosh, that long, yeah, 2015. You're getting me to think because it was post-mat leave. Yeah, so we've been GPs for, for a while. And, you know, I was a trainee and I loved my, my GP training. I had a great trainer and, um, you know, but most of my focus was on exams, getting to the end point. I didn't really think that much about the future of my career. And I don't know how you guys are and, and those of you who are coming close to the end of your training. I don't know whether you've thought about your, your career much yet, but it kind of hit me. And there's a, there's a few things I wish I, I knew beforehand that could have set me up for my career. So that's what we're gonna try and go through today. Things that you should start to think about now, even if you're a year away from finishing, the kind of things to start thinking about in terms of planning your career. How can you maximize the choices out there? And how can you create your own career going forward? And how ultimately do you look after yourself? Because you can get very busy in, in the world of general practice and how do you maintain that balance? And we'll talk a bit about that going forward as well. And of course, all our webinars come with special offers and we launched a brand new post-CCT online course a couple of days ago and people have been asking for discounts. So we're going to give a discount to 10 people um, and we're going to give the code out later on and also our flashcards as well. People have been using those recently for exam prep, but um, I think for GPs, they're quite useful for guidelines. So we're going to give 10 people a 10% discount and give a code later on in the webinar as well. So in one word, for you guys who are going to be GPs in the next one month up to a year, I suppose, how do you feel about being an independent GP? Just give me one word. How is it feeling to you right now? What's going through your mind? And I'll try and share some of the mood of the webinar. Okay, so the words that we're getting out so far, and this pr pretty much resonated with me. I don't know if you did with you, Bridget, before you started being a GP, but terrified, nervous, anxious, scary, 
uncertain, petrified, nervous, daunting, scary, terrified, nervous, excited, good, yes, excited, one excited. positive. I was excited because I had months of training left after mat leave and I was excited to finally start my journey as an independent GP. It, it is exciting, but it's kind of nervous, exciting, isn't it? Apprehensive, overwhelming, worried, overwhelmed, ah, scary, unsure, optimistic, good, excellent. Nelson, I can see that you're an optimistic guy having taught you recently happy just waiting to finish yeah look it's a long long journey 10 years minimum right some of you more than that as well so it's a long long journey and in some instances i couldn't wait to finish but in some instances i was starting to get a little bit nervous in the last few months as well thinking gosh this independent gp stuff is is pretty big and 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 that's probably reflecting how you guys are thinking right now but it's good to see a lot of excitement as well coming in so what is worrying you at the moment for those of you who said anxious nervous um overwhelmed what kind of things are on your mind that are making you feel like that right now or is it a general sense of it just give me some ideas and we'll try and touch on some of these as we go through the webinar tonight finding a job okay that's a big worry for a lot of people independent decisions i'm too slow um work too many options so we've got rca so we've got um the training side of things at the moment, being alone, don't feel as prepared as I could, lack of supervision, negotiating, finding a job, too many options, being unemployed. Yep, I guess a lot of people think about that at the moment, the COVID job market, time management. Okay, so lots and lots of repeating things, really lack of mentorship, um, time frames, what to do when, which way to go, locum partner salary. That's been a, a question that's been around for many, many years. It's still there. We'll go through some of that tonight. Yeah, a lot of people mentioned the pandemic as well. And of course, that's changed the whole scene of general practice. And one of the things that we'll talk about later is how to stay on top of an ever-changing world and how your mindset has to adapt to that because it is very, very difficult when things are changing around you, sometimes not in your control, sometimes in your control. Appraisal, we'll talk about that tonight a little bit as well. Um, confusion about the fellowships. Yep, I think Pooja's got a few words on fellowships coming up later on. Lack of jobs, uh, low coming change, et cetera. Yeah, so lots and lots of very very real worries very real concerns and 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 i feel them i hear them and um i had a lot of those myself you know back at, back when i was in my final few months so i totally get it and you've almost had this this period of stressing about these hurdles in front of you akt csa or now rca of course getting through arcp getting all your assessments done so your mind's kind of been distracted and now you're kind of at the edge of the cliff and it's well wow now i've got, got to jump off and, and do my own thing so we'll cover some of these things tonight um going forward because i think puja you had some of these concerns and worries as well when is your time absolutely i was excited but uh, that first day of work as an independent gp certainly brought some of these fears to light um being independent time management all of these things so i can totally relate to everything that you guys are saying okay so let's move on to number one then the first thing that I wish I knew or thought about before becoming a GP. I had no idea how many types of GP I could be. I was trained to be a GP and to me a GP was a GP, but having come out of training and within probably six months of independent general practice, I realized how big a world is um, the general practice is. And, and the way that sometimes we're shielded as trainees because we just don't have enough time to look for all these things, but also we don't get exposed to all these things as well. So if you can just run off a list, let's see how many types of GP we can get from you guys before we go into some of the options that we have available. What are the kind of GPs that we can have? And what are you thinking about potentially going forward in your career? So we've got the big three obviously come out straight away, locum, salaried and partnership. Portfolio GP, got a lot of buzz around portfolio GP. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Partner, salaried, portfolio, gypsy, academic teaching, uh, private versus NHS, uh, special interest like dermatology, salary, gypsy, gypsy, academic, CCG work, good. Um, what else is coming up? Retainer, good, we'll talk about that. Aesthetics, yep, army GP, excellent education, prison GP, supervisor. Um, so yeah, lots, good, good. So I didn't think about half of these things. I had the traditional thought, do I be a locum, a partner, or a salary GP? That was all I really thought about when I was a trainee. And then suddenly I got exposed to all these choices that you are now able to make. Like when you're in training, you're kind of on the hamster wheel, aren't you? You're trying to just get from one um, part of the system to another, and they're all kind of hoops that you're jumping through. But now suddenly you've got to start making some choices. And yes, when you're a trainee, there are choices to make, 
but their choices are within a boundary. And now suddenly you're at this situation where you've got a multiple number of possible pathways to think about. So we've obviously got the traditional styles of GP, so partnership, salaried, locum. These days, digital GP, you know, can you solely work in front of a computer screen, out of hours GP? There are some GPs who just work out of hours, so they just do nights or just do weekends, and that suits them perfectly. Portfolio GP will cover a little bit later, but it's obviously a bit of a bit of a lot of different things. How do you want to work? What choice do you want to do in terms of the way you work? Do you want to be part time? Do you want to be full time? And if it's full time, is it full time clinical, full time something else or block work? Say, for example, I just want to work Mondays and Tuesdays. That's just going to be my working style. You have the choice to decide your own week. And that's a big thing that we don't often think about before we come out of training. People have mentioned already GP retainer scheme, GP fellowships. Pooja's going to talk a bit about those a little bit later on, just to kind of clarify what those are in terms of your options going forward. And then I guess all the kind of portfolio stuff that you guys have mentioned already. So medical education, that's obviously my passion. Um, medical legal, insurance stuff, medical political, that's Pooja's passion. Uh, research, doctorpreneur, there's a big buzz about how to become an entrepreneur as a GP. Lots of GPs are jumping into entrepreneurship. Gypsy, GP with special interest, people have mentioned that already. Aesthetics, travel GP, GP abroad, occupational health, private general practice. Huge, huge, huge numbers of choices that you guys are going to have to make, or don't have to make, but have the option to make going forward, apart from the traditional partner versus salaried versus locum debate, which has obviously gone on for years and, and will be there going forward. Anything else I've missed, Pooja? Anything else I've missed? Someone's mentioned A&E GP. Anything else that I haven't put in? Can you think of? Uh, media GP. Media GP, yep. There's a big, big buzz. I don't know if you guys have seen the numbers of influencers coming up in terms of GPs now on Instagram and um, and Twitter and, and and doing radio and TV. So if that's for you, we've got some some humanitarian work. Absolutely, a lot of GPs are doing humanitarian work as well. So loads and loads of things. If anything comes up, just put them in the comments. And um, we may have forgotten some because things come up every single day. What's GSM contract? Miriam has asked. You probably yeah. you could probably mention that later on. Absolutely. Okay, so the first thing I didn't really think about before ending training was the number of choices that I had, and some of the choices that I had to make very very quickly. So when I came out of GP training, I was quite lucky. Um, I was lucky that my current training practice offered me a kind of long term locum role. So I did that for two days, and then I had to figure out what I do for the remaining three days, and that's when some of these choices started to come into play. So some people talk about possible extra qualifications. And if you're thinking about some of those additional routes in general practice, then one of the questions that people often ask is, should I do an extra qualification? Is it worth me doing something else? Now, some of you guys might have done some of these already in GP training, DRCOG, for example, I did when I was a GP trainee. And some of you guys, no doubt, have done DFSRH. But when you get to the end, you've finished your exams, your mandatory exams, that is, of course, you don't need to do any further exams going forward. But some people like to do qualifications. So we often get questions about what should we do. Now, when it comes to doing extra qualifications as a GP, I think a lot of people do them because of the wrong reasons. Some people do them because they think that I, I should do this kind of thing because this is what the sensible thing to do is. Or um, I've been told this is a good idea, so maybe I should do this particular qualification. Or I've been told it's a good idea to do a qualification full stop so you kind of just jump onto one because it's one that's local to your area. You've got to think about two Ps, I think, when it comes to extra qualifications, passion or plan. Ideally, you want both of these, but at least you've got to have one of these two Ps. Otherwise, I wouldn't think about doing something additional. So passion, firstly, if you've got a passion for something and you love dermatology, you've always loved dermatology, you've got a passion for it, you will make it work. You'll start the diploma, you'll start your extra degree, and you'll push through it because it's not easy to keep going and doing exams and assessments when you don't really have to do them. So if you have a passion for it, you're more likely to get to the end and make it work. Or you need a plan. So, okay, I'm gonna do this dermatology diploma. And the reason I'm doing it is because I think in this area, there's maybe a need or a growing market as it were for dermatology. I think I can offer a service in this area. Maybe I've got a plan that I'm gonna to go to a group of practices and say, look, um, I can maybe start up a dermatology service for your group and maybe improve patient care, save you some money, et cetera. So, if you don't have a passion, at least have a plan, but preferably have both P's in place. Because if you do, then it's much easier to push through some of these things. Because some of these are not easy. They take a bit of time. And remember, you're still getting used to working as an independent GP, which is very different to having that backing of a trainer and a practice behind you. So you often fall off the ladder. And I see people start these things, but finish them, usually because they haven't got one of these two P's. So if you're thinking about something else, 
think about these two really carefully before you jump on something. And remember, it's fine not to do anything. Like you've worked really hard to get MRCGP and that is enough for many, many people. So don't do something in addition just because you think you need to or because people are telling you to do so. Is there a growing market, inverted commas? You've got to think a little bit like this. You know, it, we all know that things are coming from secondary care into primary care. So pretty much anything you're upskilling, you, there may be a need for it in the future going forward. So usually there is a market, but you've got to have these two P's in place. So what are the kind of things that people often do as GPs? Medical education obviously is a big one, the, the postgraduate certificate followed by the diploma, followed by the masters if you're really into it. Um, dermatology leadership is obviously a big thing these days, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, geriatric medicine, occupational medicine, ENT, um, the women's health diplomas, minor surgery, joint injections, MRCP. Some people like to do that as well. Some people already have MRCP as GPs. Um, but again, that's something that you've got to have a passion for. I wouldn't do it just to try and get a, a job, for example. And then the DCH is one that people do as well. What are you guys thinking? Are you planning to do any of these things, planning to start them? And what is your reason for doing it? Just let us know. Give us a bit of feedback in terms of what you're thinking. No more exams. Yeah, fair enough. A lot of people are saying I've had enough. And that's fair enough. And, you know, you, you've worked hard to, to get to this point where you can choose not to do things. Minor surgery, people are saying children are the future. Um, I switched from general surgery, so you're probably going to be looking to do some of that going forward, which makes sense. Lifestyle medicine, we didn't mention that was one of the options. Yeah, Lifestyle absolutely. medicine is obviously a big, big trend at the moment. It tells what people are in DRCOG dermatology yeah so as you can see that there's a common two or three that people tend to do so if you're not in one of the brackets where you've got a passion or a plan then you may find yourself with one of these qualifications and you may not be able to do anything with it so you've got to have at least that passion or plan going forward but it sounds like some of you guys have um and that's a good thing Pooja, anything to add on this what, what did you do any of these after you didn't did you I did. I did the DRCOG, yeah, okay. but but don't do it for the reason I did it. So I managed to get through the whole of GP training without doing any OBS and gynae placement. And being a female GP, I was really worried that when I fully qualified without any supervision, am I going to be skilled enough to deal with OBS and gynae cases? So I went ahead and did the DRCOG. In hindsight, I'm not, I'm not sure that it really helped me at all. Um, my training was more than sufficient. Um, so as Amin said, it's really important to choose a qualification that you have a passion or some sort of plan moving forward. Brilliant. OK, so let's move on to number two. And some of you guys have mentioned this already in terms of one of your fears. I had no idea how much I would feel out of depth. Now, some of you guys are already thinking about this, which is good because you're having a bit of insight as to how much, how, how you're going to feel when you first start as a GP. But nothing can really prepare you for that first day. I remember going in and even though I was a trainee, I think it was Tuesday. I was it was my last day as a trainee and I went back to do a locum in the very same practice the next day. But it felt so different, even though I was at the same practice, same patient cohort same members of staff that I knew day in day out and I knew really well I had my trainer still in the same room it felt so different that out of depth feeling that okay this is me on my own now and I've got to make independent decisions of course I didn't have to do that and I could still go to my trainer and ask questions but I remember that feeling and I remember just thinking gosh what 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 has this year done for me like where all these exams that I've done has it really prepared me to be a GP and 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 I think it doesn't matter how confident you are you're always going to feel this kind of sense of, gosh, I'm on my own. This is scary. This is worrying. Um, and it's fine. And it's normal. And, and anyone who's saying that they, ha they don't have that feeling and they're feeling absolutely fine, they're, they're probably kidding themselves because it is a huge, huge step. So I didn't know how much this was going to hit me. So when it did hit me, like confidence got hit in a big way. Pooja, I don't know if that's the same with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the first day that first patient that you feel a little bit stuck on, it may be in the middle of your session, it may be towards the end, it may be right at the beginning. Um, it's absolutely normal to feel, oh, I, I've got no one that I can go to to ask questions. That's certainly not the feeling that you should be having once you fully qualify because we'll talk about it later on, but if you are stuck, there is always someone that you can go to to ask for help. Yeah, I think that's really important. The first few days, weeks, months, the first thing is expect to feel a bit alone, expect to feel a bit overwhelmed because 
anything that you kind of allow yourself to expect, it doesn't hit you so hard. If you go and thinking, you know, I'm fine and I'll be great and I've, I'm trained for this and I'm prepped for this, it's going to hit you harder when you start to have those feelings. So if you go in and expect to feel a little bit vulnerable, expect that it's going to take me a few days to get used to it, expect that even though I might go back to the same practice even, I'm still going to feel a little bit overwhelmed, then it tends to hit you a little bit less. It doesn't it's going to burden up on you so much. Form a CBD group, this is really important. And not when you're stressed and when everyone is suddenly panicking and trying to figure out what to do beforehand. Find a few people that you know are going to finish around the same time as you. Um, kind of just sound by each other, really, and just you know give yourself the ability to talk to each other quite a lot over the first couple of days, couple of weeks, so that you realize that I'm not the only person feeling like this. Yes, you know I feel like I'm on my own when I do my clinic, but actually there's there's another, I don't know how many thousand people starting on this day as independent GP. So form a little group that you can sound bite off, really, really important. Don't try and look for that group when you're already feeling stressed. Stay in touch with trainers and PDs. I was super, super lucky that obviously I was working with my trainer for two days of the week or my ex-trainer. Um, and I stayed in touch with my PDs and, and you know, they've heard this a hundred times, thousands of times, and people come back to them a little bit stressed after starting um, and they've heard it before. So make sure you maintain touch with these people because they know you, they've been with you for, for three years. They kind of know your ins and outs. They know what to say, what not to say. So make sure you use them for the right reasons in the first couple of days, weeks, and months. And this period could be different for everybody. Some people, within a few days, they start to get their feet. And sometimes it takes a few months. And that's, you know, everything is fine for you. You've got to be individual. But keep in touch with people who can help. And sometimes you just need a bit of reassurance. That actually, you know what? I do know what I'm doing. So going through some of your old stuff, your old AKT notes, your old CSA notes, or RCA stuff now, just going through that and seeing, like, okay, actually, I do know my stuff. You may feel like you've forgotten everything already. You know, when you do your AKT and then you, then after a week, you think you've forgotten everything. It's the same feeling. You'll just feel like, I don't know how to be a GP. I don't know how to see this cough. Have I missed any red flags? It's just all will start to flood on you. But just sometimes going back to your old notes, realize, OK, actually, I, I did OK in that consultation. I did do everything I was supposed to do. It's quite reassuring. And if I'd known all of this before I started, I would have prepared myself for it. Then I probably wouldn't have been hit so hard in that first couple of clinics where I started doubting every single thing that I did um, just because of the nature of the fact that you are now an independent GP and it can be very, very, very overwhelming. The third thing, so we're going to move into a bit of locum now because I, I locumed initially and I hadn't really planned for locuming. I just kind of heard that, yeah, everyone does a bit of locuming and it's just the, what you do when you finish training. So I just kind of jumped on the bandwagon and booked some locums. And I never really thought how much organization it takes to actually work effectively as a locum. Because remember, when you're working as a locum, often you're working in new environments. And new environments come with their own challenges. Number one, you've got all this doubt going on about, am I good enough? And gosh, I've forgotten how to, to listen to a chest. And then suddenly you've got to think about all these additional things that come with being an independent GP, but then also an independent locum. You've got to think about all the other issues that are important when it comes to locuming as a GP. Now, people talk a lot about pros and cons of, of locum general practice, and obviously the scene at the moment is probably different to what it was when I started with the whole pandemic going on. But, and you have heard these pros and cons before, and, and for some of these um, reasons, they're pros for some people and they're cons for others. The greens, why do people choose to locum? Flexibility is obviously a big one. You choose to work when you want and when you don't want. And that's a great thing for some people, but it's a, a hindrance for other people as well, because some people need routine. So this might not be a pro for you, but it is certainly for some people. You set your rates. Now you're an independent your entity. You can charge what you want. Obviously, you might charge yourself out of the market, but you have the ability to set the rates that you want, as opposed to say a salaried job where your your dictate your rate is dictated to you. Obviously, you can use it as a bit of a, a feeler, really. You can try a few different practices, see what works for you, what sort of areas seem to work for me, what sort of working environment seems to work for me, what sort of time seems to work for me. And you can almost, you know, play the play the the field a bit and then figure out what, what do I enjoy and where can I see myself working for the next two, three, four, 20, 30, 40 years even. And of course, it can be good income. It depends on how much you do. And and, and if you're really dedicated to it and, you, and you're going for income, then it can be a very good source of income. And it's usually better than salaried general practice if you can find regular work. But again, it takes organization, takes planning. And we'll talk about some of these things in a second. What are some of the reds then? So the, your employment rights obviously are not there. You're an independent business as it is. So you don't really get the rights that you'd get as, as an employee. You may not get regular work. Certainly at the moment, people are struggling in certain areas of the, of the UK trying to get locum work. So it may be everyone's plan that I want to locum, but then you suddenly get there and think, gosh, well, I can't find anything. So then sometimes you, you, you're you in a, 
in a buyer's market as it were so um seller's market even i'm getting the wrong way around so you can almost you almost have to take what you get which is a difficult situation to be in it can affect certain things like getting mortgages and and you know there's certain things that you'd have to do extra than people who are employed for example to make sure you can get those mortgages in place because you can't really guarantee regular income unless it's happened over a long period of time it can be more risky but you're obviously jumping in and out of different practices and as you guys know as gp trainees how long it took you to get used to your own practice whether it's an st2 or st3 so when you suddenly jump into a new one and your first patient walks in and it's you know it's a bit scary therefore it can be a bit risky and it may make you doubt yourself even more and it can be lonely you know unless you're lucky and, and you're locoming in in two or three places fairly regularly you may get that feeling of i am on my own and especially if you think you know that you're going to be a person who is going to take a little bit of time to bed yourself in as a GP, then jumping into five different locum shifts and five different practices um, in, within one week might not be something that is for you. So there are definitely pros and cons, and it's worth thinking about whether it's right for you. So I thought it was right for me at that point, but there was a lot of things that I didn't think about. I didn't think about having terms and conditions. Now, this is super, super important because you are, remember, an independent business entity. You are trading with another organization. So you have to have your terms and conditions because if those things aren't in place and they're not understood by a practice who is booking you, then when issues come about later on, you've not really got anything to fall back on. So make sure you have your T's and C's. Um, and the course we've created talks about how to create those T's and C's as a locum. Confirm shifts in writing. This is really important. You know, a lot of people um, know practices who they're booking locums with. So it's kind of done verbally. Oh, can you do Friday two to five? Yes, of course I can. And then you rock up on Friday two to five and there's another locum already sitting in the chair and it's, well, oh, sorry, we, 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 we double booked. So if you've got things in writing, you're in a better position. So you've got to start to get these things done. Whereas sometimes we, we don't think like that because we know the people we're dealing with, but you've got to think a little bit now about how to do things as a business because you are an independent business keep a diary of shift this is really important you know you could get a call from a practice and say yes and then the next morning get another call from another practice say yes and before you know it, you've double booked and you know it's our responsibility as locums or your responsibility as a locum to make sure you're not doing this because if you have realized you've double booked then you're going to leave a practice in in danger and if you haven't got t's and c's for example then it might come back and cause you a bit of trouble so make sure these things are all in place you've got to be organized systems are really important when you're a locum gp You've got to obviously invoice every single individual practice and there are forms to do not just for invoicing for your hours, but also things like pension and, and, and locum forms A, locum form B, which we'll talk about later on. But all this stuff, if you don't have a system for it, then you're going to struggle to remember every single session that you did, particularly for jumping from one place to another. There are organizations that do this for you and there are companies that do this for you. And I'm sure you've come across them, um, but you need a system in place. And then little things that I didn't realize when, when I went into a few different locum practices, I was signed in as Dr. Locum. Now, no one had told me that this should not be the case, because if you think about it, if they're having a different locum every Friday evening, and it's been like that for the last three years, and they're all been logged as Dr. Locum, like when, if something happens and, and a complaint comes in or whatever it might be, it's very, very difficult to A, show you know it's a lot harder to prove that you were there not there for example because it's not signed in as your own name but also if it's just dr locum you don't know how that could have been changed or when entries could have been changed etc so make sure when you think about doing a locum make sure you push to have your own login details so it's you you know it's you on the system um, and that when you go back you use those same systems not just the standard dr locum that sometimes people are and i was often signed in as um and i think it was puja who who told me that you know what are you doing when she she heard about all of this stuff as well yeah absolutely so my passion is medico politics so i've uh, done a lot of work um within the bma um and lmc so i've heard of all these horror stories um and so the issue with dr locum is not only is it how do you prove that you've actually worked that shift but generally that also means that it's a generic login and a generic password so you've also got to think about can someone go back into your notes log in and change details we hope things like that don't happen but it's just about protecting yourself and making sure that you are having your own login details and nobody can go back in and alter your notes very very important point the one that i didn't think about what else to think about? So sometimes higher rates may mean higher workload, of course. So you may see um, an ad go around for a three-hour session. You think, wow, that, that's that's good. 
you know, good income, let's take it. And then you get, then you realize there's lots of extra things that are supposed to be expected of you. And that's sometimes where your T's and C's come in. Think about shifts, you know, what, what sort of, if you want to be a locum, what sort of locum will suit you best? Do you want to do two or three really solid days that you dedicate to locum work and then have the rest of the week off? Or do you want to do regular short days, maybe do five mornings a week, for example, but not afternoons? And you can work this obviously around your other needs, your other interests, your other um, other things that are going on in your life right now. So what, again, one of the flexibility points is a bonus, but if you're not organized, then it can get a little bit challenging in terms of trying to balance lots of things especially when you haven't got regularity in your life. And that's one of the things that people who don't like locoming often mention. It's the lack of regularity, the lack of being able to plan, the lack of not knowing that I may not have work next week. They can be quite difficult. Rates. Rates might seem very good, but then what do they include? What are the other things that, that does it have pension there, for example? Are there other things that you need to be bearing in mind in terms of what that rate includes? So don't just go by rates. Think about what, what could this high rate mean and what else could it include? If it's a low rate, do they have additional things on top of it? So again, these kind of things are things that I didn't really realize when I thought about locum general practice. And I jumped into it and I started learning these things afterwards a little bit on the hard way. And don't forget to, to keep aside for your tax bill because remember you're getting paid per hour, but it's your responsibility to make sure that a percentage of that is gonna be used at some point to pay my tax bill. And the first tax bill often is, is, is a killer one for people. So they haven't planned very well. So if you're gonna be a salary GP, of course, you don't have to worry about this. It's all done within your pay slip. And it's kind of as you are now as trainees, where suddenly when in the world of locum practice, and I know this gets a lot of people, suddenly when that first tax bill comes in, it hits them because they haven't really planned for it. They haven't thought about it sometimes even, um, and suddenly have to work lots and lots and lots of extra shifts just to be able to pay that tax bill. So it's one thing that you need to think about going forward. And we have a whole section on finances in the online course that we have to talk about these kind of things so that you don't get caught out um, when you start locoming as a GP. So the fourth thing, I do, and this kind of follows on really, I had no idea how important good accounting was and good financial advice would be. I kind of thought when I first started training, well, I can manage this. I can manage my invoices. I can manage my tax returns. Like, how hard can it be? And then within about, I don't know, a month and a half, I realized, okay, this is tough because I was not only trying to balance where am I getting my roles? Where am I getting my jobs? What, you know, what rates am I doing? Can I, can I have I got enough time to get from one practice to another? Like what are my shift patterns? Have I got the equipment that I need? Have I got my logins properly? Am I doing my medicine properly? Um, suddenly I started thinking about all the invoicing and all the accounting and all the pension stuff and all the, the other things that you have to think about now, obviously the things like IR35, there's a, there's a huge number of additional things to think about. And if you don't have someone who is sound behind you in terms of being someone that you can fall back on and ask silly questions to, then you're taking it all on your head and it can be quite challenging. So there's a lot of questions that come out about finance, whether it's locoming or salary or partnership. Do I need an accountant or not? And you may not, you know, some people don't need an accountant and they're, they're okay to themselves and that's fine. If you are going to get an accountant, do you want a general accountant or do you want a medical accountant? Some people only go with medical accountants because they obviously know how medics work, particularly how locums work as well. Um, and they know the ins and outs about things like NHS pension, as opposed to a, a general accountant who may not have that specific detail that may come with other benefits. Pension, are you, I don't know if you guys are still in the pension scheme or not, if you're planning on staying in or coming out, but you need to know about the pension. You need to know your options. You need, before you make decisions about things like this, you need to get advice. You need to make sure that you've got the right advice for you as well. And that often comes with getting the right people behind you. Things like income protection, things like critical illness cover, you know, regardless of whether you're salaried locum partnership, these things are really, really important. And if you don't think about them or you don't have somebody who's talking to you about them and suggesting these things, then you may overlook them and then think, oh, gosh, I wish I'd look back and got someone on some advice. So getting this thing in place early on is really, really important. Remember, you're, you've not got that protection that you have as a trainee now for lots and lots of different things. And these are things that you need to put in place or at least think about putting in place pretty early on in your career. Say you've got a salary uh, contract, for example, you know, you need to read your contract properly, but does it follow things like DDRB recommendations? So, for example, are you going to get a pay rise when it's suggested that pay rises happen? Because if you've got a contract and it doesn't say that, then maybe you're, you're, you're not going to get that. So these kind of things are really important. And again, checking things like contracts are important, but the financial part of these things can be advised by someone who knows what they're talking about. So something that's very important to think about if you haven't thought about finance, regardless of whether you're locum salaried or partner yep a bit so, about locum stuff as well finance wise so 
uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's so important to be organized as a locum. Um, and so when it comes to finances, if you are part of the NHS pension scheme, you need to think about getting your forms in on time. You have a limited time frame, and we talk about this in the course, um, to hand in your pension forms. And if you miss that time frame because you're not organized, um, then you can't contribute that amount to towards your pension. So that's really important to think about. Um, IR35, now that sort of follows on in relation to do you choose to be a limited company or not and it's important to get good financial advice from an accountant based on your whole set of income whether it's worth you being a limited company or working self-employed as a locum and that will then determine your IR35. Now this was um, something that was introduced by the government um, and Essentially, IR35 is important because many practices will ask you about it um, when you apply for a locum with a surgery. And it's important because if you don't deem your right IR35 status, then that could mean that the practice is handed with a hefty tax bill um, and nobody wants that. So we talk about ways in which you can calculate um, whether IR35 applies to you and if it doesn't as a locum and these are things that you need to be thinking about. Someone's already spoken about the importance of getting good financial advice from a financial advisor, you know, about protecting your income. So particularly now in COVID times, you know, locum work is hard to find. Um, but, you know, if you've planned yourself financially, then hopefully this is just a slight dull period and you'll get through it. So you've got to think about it. Normally, in terms of putting money aside for the tax bill, I used to go by the principle of putting around 30 percent of whatever income I got aside. So th these are the sort of things you need to be thinking about as locum. And and thirty and thirty percent, I'd say, is conservative. I said sometimes people say fifty percent, and and just because you want a little bit extra rather than less, and it's always a bonus that when your tax bill comes, you've got enough there plus a bit extra rather than okay, I wish I'd put another five percent aside because. Um, but that's something that you need to work out for yourself, and obviously people's tax rates might be different, and that's where financial advice is important. One thing that's really important: locum insurance. I did not think about this at all. I didn't even know about locum insurance, but locum insurance is really important, and it may not be important for everybody but it's important to think about and discuss with somebody who knows about this stuff. Because again, what you don't wanna do is make decisions based on information that we don't really understand. You know, we, we're not, we spent 10, however many years it is training to be a GP. Yes, there are bits of finances that come along the way, but we don't really, we haven't dedicated the time that it takes to understand this kind of stuff. So suddenly you're making decisions that may have implications going forward. And that's where getting advice is really, really important. So whether you're locum salaried or partner, partners are different kettle of fish altogether, um, some kind of advice should not be underestimated. Okay, this kind of follows on a little bit from what some people said their fears were as well. I did not know how many tough days there would be. I remember when I was, I think it was how long, probably six months into me being a GP, where I kind of came home and goes, this is this is ridiculous, like it's too much. And, and I'd done the classic thing of, I, I was booking lots of sessions, um, I, by then I think I was, I think I was salaried in one practice for like half a week and then I was locuming for the other half a week and I was trying to set up Aurora Medical Education as well. So I was, I, I was probably burnt out and I came back, I remember six months ago and I was I just uh, six months into it and I felt like this is, how am I going to do this for forever? This is tough, really, really, really tough. And a lot of our colleagues who are GPs who finished around the same time as me at some point have gone through the, the phase where they thought that they, they, I just did not know how tough this was going to be because everything kind of builds up on you. And, you know, w when you're a trainee, of course, it's very, very tough there as well. And I remember feeling really overwhelmed sometimes when, in my training, but you always had that cushion of someone that you could turn to, always had that cushion of a PD you could talk to or a cushion of a supervisor that you could talk to. And you almost felt like everything is not on me. Whereas when you're at your own GP, these things build up and it makes those tough days really, really difficult. So there will be days when you are overwhelmed. It goes back to what we talked about, about expecting it, expecting to have these times where you're gonna feel like, gosh, this is a bit too much. And is this really what I signed up for for the rest of my life? Expecting that you're gonna be overwhelmed is really, really important. You've gotta have your go-tos. This has gotta be pre-planned in advance. You can't 
Um, for example, when you're starting to go through a tough period, think, okay, right, I need to think, who can I go to to talk to? Because you're not really in that state of mind. You, you, you're feeling pretty zoned out as it is. You need to have go-tos in place. You need to already plan this. You need to think that, okay, when when it happens, when I start to have those days where I think, okay, this is really tough, who am I going to go to? Get them in position so that you can just pick the phone up or go see them or do whatever. This could be your trainer. This could be some. This could be your PD. This could be someone who you who you finished with. This could be someone totally different. But don't try and figure out your go-to at stressful times. Make sure you have that in place. Go early. Really important. Don't wait for it to go too much. I remember coming back and I probably let it go a little bit too long, um, and I probably hadn't mentioned it to anyone. And then someone's like, "Okay, now now I'm really struggling." And but if I'd have gone earlier, then things might have been different. Like you've got to sometimes have that ability to notice. Okay, things are not quite right, but I've planned for it, and I and I know what to do when it happens. And you put an intervention in early on. Go early to your bit, and have a plan in place. Like I said, don't try and work out a plan when you're going through a tough time because it's it's ten times harder. Make sure you've thought about it before. Absolutely. Um, one of the my main go tos is a WhatsApp group of all our GP friends. And whenever I'm feeling stressed out or I've got a case that I'm not sure about, that's what we're talking about forming that CPD group, um, which is an education group just amongst you and your colleagues where you can just sort of debrief. You know, you've had a really difficult patient. How do you deal with them? Um, you know, just somewhere to let off your steam. You could be really frustrated with how a case has gone you're not sure what to do so having that group in place is really important um, and as Amin said it's really important to seek help early um, and make sure that you know how to seek help when you need it okay moving on to number six then I had no idea genuinely no idea how much you have to promote yourself like we've gone through training and there's been a bit of promotion going on. You've had to pass certain assessments. You've had to get into GP training. You've had to do various OSCEs. You have to show how good you are. But when you come out the other side, you, you've got to almost be a little bit unashamed in in selling yourself, you know, explaining how you can help practices, explaining why you should be the one that you need to get this role as a salary GP, explaining why you're the right partner for this practice. Um, selling yourself and promoting yourself is not something that comes very easily to people and therefore people who struggle with it can sometimes find it difficult to get jobs get employment and people were saying at the beginning one of the fears that they have is getting a job and and i hear that and one of the reasons that people sometimes fear getting jobs is not because they're not good enough because the c credentials are there you know that you can do the job that's in front of you it's how do i actually get to the position where someone else thinks that i should be having that job and that's why promotion and self-promotion is actually really, really important. It's not a something that you should shy away from. Where do you promote yourself? You've got to promote yourself in your CV first and foremost. People haven't seen you. They've got to get a really good first impression. You've got to promote yourself in a covering letter. So yes, one thing to send a CV, but your covering letter sets the scene. It gives you an insight into your personality. How do you write a good covering letter? That's really important. Make sure it's got something that stands out. And then of course, you've got to promote yourself an interview and going in and showing confidence and and showing them why that why I'm the person for you why am I the person that's going to come and help your practice is sometimes something that we don't necessarily do very much ourselves we haven't really had to do that to be honest when you were a trainee when you were going through med school and you don't the way that you get positions and the way you get into training for example is through demonstrating your ability and assessments now it's a different story there are no assessments to get you a job there are no assessments to get you um, into a partnership so you've got to start to learn how to promote yourself and I didn't really know this I didn't really think about this I didn't really get the fact that I'm going to have to promote myself or even sell myself if you want to put it in that term but this is these are skills um, that you need to pick up because whatever you do even if you go into some of the other careers that we talked about medical education medical politics you are always constantly on the need to promote yourself to show people how you are going to benefit them and that's something that I hadn't really thought about. And it's something that it's worth starting to think about now. So if you are an ST3 and you're going to be coming into a position pretty soon where you're thinking about applying, start on these things now. Start writing your CV. When is the last time you wrote a CV? Probably, I don't know, med school times. I don't know. But think about rewriting your CV. Look at how to do it. We've covered it in our course, how to write a covering letter, how to write a CV, how to excel at interview. Start to think about these things now, not when you finished and now you see a job application and you've got to send in an, an, your CV by next week. That's not the time to start writing a CV. Now's the time to do it. Once exams are out the way, once you've got this bit, little bit of a period between now and the end, 
this is when you've got to start writing things like CVs and, and uh, covering letters, but one that promotes yourself, one that's not just the standard type of, this is my list of things, and, and now suddenly I want you to call me for interview. Promote yourself. And one of the best ways of promoting yourself is through enthusiasm. You know, people can can get ahead of other people in things like interviews because of enthusiasm, not because of the letters that you have next to your name, not because of the credentials that you have. Yes, that gets you a certain amount of distance. But then if you've got to choose between two people with exactly the same credentials, and remember, you're going to be pretty much in the same boat as pretty much everybody else who's come out of GP training recently. Um, and some people are going to be been already working as GPs for two, three years. So you've got to almost show even more enthusiasm than them. It can put you on a bigger pedestal. Focus on selling your abilities. You know, it's one thing to say that I've done this, I've done that, and I've done this. It's more about, well, what have I learned from this, and how can I influence your practice? How can I bring, like, for example, if someone says, you know, tell me about something that you've done that's 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 good, for example, you might say, well, I did a leadership course, but it's about how can I use what I learned in that leadership course to come in and bring it into a practice to try and help something be more positive in your practice. So it's just about how can I, yes, talk about my skills and my past, but how can I bring these things to your future? And again, we talk about that, how to do that um, in our course as well. And sell your ideas to impact change. Because if you can show an organization or a practice or a partnership, whatever it might be, how you coming in is going to benefit them, then you're in a much better position than probably what most people are gonna do, which is talk about what they've done in the past and then expect the interviewees or the interviewers even to make that connection for you. You've got to almost go in and look in the future um, and do that. And I did not realize how much I had to promote myself. And you have to practice this. You can't just go into your first interview and think that you're going to rock it. Like you need to know, you need to practice it. You need to sit down and get someone that you know to ask you questions that force you to give answers that we're not used to answering. And um, one of the most difficult things that uh, trainees find is that actually, if you're going into the practice where you were a trainee, you still need to promote yourself. So don't think that, oh, I'm going into the practice where I was a trainee, they're still going to think of me as a trainee. No, you're, you're actually applying for a job as an independent GP. So there's plenty of ways to sell yourself. It doesn't have to be just about a course or an extra qualification, as someone said. It could be something like an audit that you've done in one of your training practices and you've gone through and impacted change in that manner. So there's all sorts of ways that you can sell yourself and you, you just need to practice doing it. And that flags a really good point, actually. If you are going to go into your same practice that you're working as a trainee, make sure you you start to put seeds in to show that, okay, I'm not I'm not the trainee anymore. And this is really important. It's not a kind of high horse thing that oh, I'm a GP now, treat me differently. You've got to almost go and show that, okay, now I am I am I am different and I'm gonna I'm working as an independent GP. Otherwise, you may be the trainee inverted commas for many, many years to come. And I've seen this happen with a lot of my colleagues who are still in the training practice that they were. They, they may have become partners even in that practice, but they're still almost looked at as the trainee. So it's about changing people's mindsets by what you're doing and the way that you're doing your actions and the enthusiasm, the confidence and making, showing how you're gonna change things for the better is always a good way of doing that. Good, we're gonna have a little bit of two bait. Is this helpful? Is this useful? Just give me some feedback. What do you think? Is it making you think about things you hadn't thought about? What do you think? Give us some feedback so we can alter for the next uh, 20 or so minutes. Good, fantastic, excellent, really happy to hear. If there's any other, I know there's some questions that have been through, so we will go back at the end and answer them, I promise, but we just want to keep the flow going um, because we promise it will be an hour. Good, good, lots of kind words. Right, as I promised the deal there. So this is our brand new CCT Max online course. We've tried to cover all of the core things that I remember struggling with myself as a trainee and from feedback that I've got from trainees who've been on our other courses. So it starts with all the way about the basics, what are the types of GP, how do you get on the performance list, how do you find a job, how do you maximize things like CVs, covering letters, what are the key differences between salary, local and partnership, a bit about income, like we talked about things like setting terms and conditions, what are the kind of things that you need to be thinking about in terms of your finances, how do you deal with appraisal, what's the difference between appraisal and what you've been doing now as trainees, what are all these things about super partnerships federation so when you go into interviews you know the key things about them what's portfolio working how do you get into all of these types of things medical education medical politics private general practice etc 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 so it's a three and a half hour course there are one three six or 12 month subscriptions and we're given 20 percent off for the first 10 uses so if you go to the website um i'll show you in a second where it is and use the code cct save 20 then you'll be you'll get 20 percent off so whichever package you go for 
Um, and it's something that you can watch back again and again and again, and you can hopefully use some of them to your benefit. I will just quickly show you where it is on the website, because I know last time when we did a webinar, people were struggling to find what we were doing. So if you go to the website here and you go to online courses, you drop down, you'll find the post CCT Max online course, and then you can uh, watch a sample and you can use that um, discount if you wanted today. So that's the first thing we promised to do. And the second thing we promised to do is the flashcards. Now, I know a lot of you guys who are preparing for exams are using these flashcards, but we've actually noticed quite a lot of GPs have bought these flashcards as well because they're full of guidelines. So these are 150 cards with all the latest guidelines, hypertension, asthma, et cetera, and you just keep them in your pocket and you can use them whenever you like, in the middle of clinic or even just to revise. So again, we've got 10 uses for a 10% discount with the code card save 10 card save 10 and if you go to, and this is just kind of what's on there so you can see it's all the kind of referrals all the cancer guidelines all the latest chronic disease guidance um, and it's just there to try and help you on the way whether it's exams or whether it's something completely different and again how do you find it you go to the website and the simplest way to find it is if you drop down any of these tabs you'll find flashcards so for example akt they're on, they're on all of them stage two so you'll find flashcards all over the website so the two codes, remember, are slightly different. What else is coming up in terms of um, our events? Next Tuesday, if you're doing AKT, you want to get on this webinar, this is the final seven days hit. So people are, are now getting to that point where they're a little bit stressed about the AKT. So on Tuesday, we've got a final seven day hit to try and get you ready for your exam. Our next RCA virtual course is on the 12th of July. There are some spaces left on this course. And then we've got our two virtual Big Mark AKT courses on the 1st of August and the 4th of October, both for the August sitting and for the October sitting as well. So I'll leave this on for two minutes. These are the two codes if you need for these two things. Two minute break. We'll come back and we'll hit the final four things that I did not think about before I started my GP career. Okay, guys, I think we're going to restart. We had a quick question about how do I join the webinar next Tuesday. If you go back to the same page that you went on to book this webinar, then you'll be able to join the AKT webinar for Tuesday as well. I'll just let you know we've had four uses of the online course and five uses for the card. So there's only, remember, 10 of each. So if you're going to get them, then I'll try and get it in the next five minutes or so. But we're going to move on then. So the seventh thing that I did not realize or did not think about before I CCT, I had no idea how important networking would be. Now, we touched a bit about this in terms of finding jobs and how are you gonna make yourself stand out? How are you gonna know about the opportunity? So it's one thing to, when you get to interview or when you hear about a job, to, to, to then get it, but how do you hear about it in the first place? There's so much noise out there at the moment and people tend to tell people that they like or are friends with, how do you find out about things in the first place? How do you find out about locum jobs? How do you find out about salaried posts that are coming up? How do you find out about partnerships? If you're really fascinated by partnership, there's not many partnerships that come around in your area if you're quite fixed in the area. How do you actually find out about this? And this is where networking is so important. Now, when you're a GP trainee, you do network, of course. You, you network with people in your area and hopefully you go to, to things outside of just getting through exams. But when you're an independent GP, this is so, so important. So like we said, you need networking to find shift if you're a locum. You need to find jobs. You need networking to stay sane. You need networking to, to realize that, okay, I'm not the only person who's struggling, for example. You need networking to realize that, okay, there were other people in this boat just like me, and actually there were other people who have been in this position two years ago or three years ago and five years ago, and now look at them, they're fine. They're telling me that I went through the same difficult stuff as you, and now I'm fine. Networking is so important. It can be very, very easy to kind of just get locked into your own little bubble um, and then it just adds to things like burnout, stress, and you find that you're you're starting to struggle and, and feel quite lonely. So get networking. It helps to stay up to date. You know, have your little CPD groups, have your little CPD WhatsApp groups. Um, even if it's just social media networking, it's still staying in touch with people and making sure you stay up to date. And of course, it grows your ideas. If you don't talk to people, you don't hear about their pathways. You don't hear about their opportunities, their options. You don't hear how useful they found this course. You don't you don't hear how useful they found. I don't know, some diploma that they did. But again, if you're not networking, if you're not out there, and it can be really easy not to. So when you're in training, you have to go to VTS once a week. At VTS, what do you do? You talk about your job, you talk about how things are, you talk about forming groups, you talk about just, just chat really, and just let off steam. But when you're working on your own, there's no real need to do that. 
So sometimes people don't, and therefore it gets them into a bit of a rut situation where they're kind of stuck on their own. So get networking early on, and it's amazing how much you learn from that. Local WhatsApp groups, join them. Um, I know sometimes WhatsApp groups can just be ping, 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 ping all day, and it can be quite frustrating. You can mute them, but at least be on them so once in a while you're starting to get to know people that you can go to when you need them. Social media, like we said, there are loads and loads and loads and loads of GP groups on social media. I'm sure you guys are part of some of the big ones already, but again, this is a great place to network throw out ideas and just just make sure you're not on your own because one of the commonest things that I see is loneliness when people first go into independent general practice. And then of course, you may be networking amongst other organizations. So for example, RCGP, there are usually first five leads in your area. Um, and it's worth joining these kind of groups and just again, networking because you start to expand your ideas and you realize, okay, I'm not the only person who's um, just started, who's struggling a little bit. CCGs, LMCs, you can attend these things. You can just go and say, I want, I'm interested. Can I come and uh, sit in at a meeting? These things make a big difference. And again, you network and you get to get more ideas and things like CPD events um, as well. And there are obviously courses and things that go on for GPCPD. And it's a great place to network with people like yourself as well. Yeah, so a, a lot of you may not even know what a CCG or an LMC is. Um, essentially, it's important to know these organizations, CCGs in essence, commission services uh, that your your practices will be providing. LMC stand for local medical committees, and they are the statutory bodies pre, um, representing GPs within areas. So they're called local, so they're there should be an LMC in every area. And it's important to know about each of these organizations because these days a lot of CCGs are doing new schemes for newly qualified GPs and they're offering support networks for them. So as Aman said, it's very important to be networking, knowing about the organizations around you, knowing about courses. And as we'll talk about, this is where you find out about what options are available to you as a GP. But none of that happens without getting out there and making the effort to network. So it's really, really important. And I probably didn't do this early enough. But the moment I started making an effort, it made a huge, huge difference to how I was um, in my day to day career. Number eight, this is a bit about uh, for people who are thinking about partnership. Um, now, just a bit about my, my story and where this all fits in. So I did locuming stroke salary for about two years. And I was also by then, I think I was started my PD role and I was doing a few other medical education roles as well. Also trying to, to build a raw med ed. But at that point, I started to think, OK, partnership. Why did I think about partnership? I, I don't really know, to be honest. And I think I started thinking about partnership because it just seemed to be what everybody does. Like you, you, you jump off general practice training, you, you do a bit of locuming, maybe you salary for a bit, and then you think about partnership. That's just that's just what was fed to me. That was the role that was drilled into me since day one, that all GPs eventually become a partner or think about it at least. So I started thinking, OK, well, maybe I better become a partner. Like I was actually by that stage, I'd got over that little little six month rut and I was back into enjoying what I was doing and I had multiple roles. I was doing a portfolio career. I didn't even know I was doing it, but that's what I was doing at that point. But I started thinking, OK, I better, I better look for partnerships. So I found a partnership. And, you know, again, I, I use my networks. I talked to my trainer and I was like, well, do you know anything? And they mentioned there was a there was a partnership coming up. So I went to have a bit of a chat with them and it got to a stage where I went for an interview. And. In my interview, I got blown away. Like I, I, I was asked questions that I hadn't even considered. So I had no idea how much you need to think about as a partner. It's a totally different kettle of fish to locum, salo, GP, or any other field I can think of. And it's something that needs a bit of research if you're thinking about doing it. So what are the pros and cons about partnership? Generally good income. I mean, it, it is a business. So if you manage it well, it can be a very good income stream. So that's some people like the fact that they can create their own income and they can determine how much income they have. Property ownership may be a part of the partnership. Some people see that as a very big plus. So you're kind of buying into a building and by the end you're going to have shares in a building, which is which is something that you know is, a, is a, an asset that's not going to go away. There may be some partnership benefits. For example, there may be private medical care, there may be RCGP fees paid for. This obviously depends from practice to practice. There may be a paid sabbatical within your partnership agreement. So there are lots of pros that you can kind of build into a partnership and that's the the beauty of having that partnership system because it's your own independent business and you can work it as you like to an extent. You can influence how the practice works. Some people, I hear a lot of people who, who have been doing salaried roles for three or four years, getting quite frustrated because they're, they're finding it quite difficult to influence and impact change. And when you're a partner, of course, you can you can do that, not, not easily, but you can do it easier when you have control over how a practice runs. 
And therefore, you can therefore have greater control on patient care, working patterns, and all the other things that come with modern day general practice. So huge pros if you're pro partnership. But what are the things that go against it? Last man standing, buck stops with you. These are high pressurized roles sometimes. If you're not running a practice properly or you're finding that um, it's getting quite overwhelming and maybe two of the other three partners leave, then it can be quite a difficult situation. Again, I've seen colleagues who have really struggled in partnerships through no fault of their own, but just because of the nature of events that happen around you and the fact that you are the last man standing and the buck ultimately starts with you as it does with any business that you might own. You have to get au fait with other things. HR, for example, health and safety issues, CQC, all the stress that goes with these kind of things has to be put on your shoulders when you're a partner. So it has lots of pros, but lots of potential cons. And some people thrive on this, by the way. Some people love all this kind of stuff and they find it that totally to their mindset. Some people really, really, really struggle. So it's important to figure out what type of person you are. Sometimes properties, liabilities come in place as well. So it's a good thing maybe to get into a partnership in terms of owning property, but it can leave with liabilities as well. Again, particularly if people leave um, how do you get into, you know around disputes, etc. No employment rights, just like as a locum, I suppose. So unless built into your partnership contract, things like maternity leave, sick leave, things that you take for granted sometimes may not be there. And again, like we mentioned, if a partnership is not managed well, then income may not be great. And actually, I've heard stories of how um, the partners are getting paid least out of all the other doctors in the practice just because the fact that they get the takeout, the take home. Um, after everybody gets paid. So lots of pros, lots of cons, but as as with most things, most things can be made a pro or a con depending on how you look at it and how you manage that particular system. But what are the things that you had to think about? So in interview, for example, the stuff that I hadn't really thought about, what are the things that I should have done to make sure I was a bit ahead of the game in terms of interview? I didn't get the, the partnership, by the way, and looking back at it, it was I'm super glad that I didn't. But but um, I, know I, I could have and I should have prepared a little bit better. So what do you want to achieve with partnership? Um, is it a work-life balance or is it an income-based system that you're looking for? Again, know what you want before you walk into an interview because, uh, or even before you consider partnership. If you don't know what you want, then you may walk into the wrong partnership. Research the practice beforehand. Find out, look at look at websites, look at local reports, look at um, CQC figures, look at all these kind of things, QOF results, because again, it gives you a bit of an idea and something that you can bring into an interview and talk about. Find out why they're recruiting. Okay, a partnership is suddenly popped up out of the blue. It's not just popped up out of the blue. There is a reason why a partnership vacancy has come. Has someone retired? Has there been a dispute? Has a practice broken into two? What is the reason why there's that suddenly something that you've heard about on the grapevine? Understand this before you go in. If you can, speak to the staff, make an informal visit. Sometimes practices are quite open about this and they want you to come and have a visit and speak to the staff. But it'd be important to try and think about doing that. Ask for partnership accounts. It's amazing how many times people go into a partnership, but they have not looked at partnership accounts. On average, you'd be looking back about three years. Um, again, don't just look at it yourself. Get someone who knows what they're looking at to look at it. It's one thing to say, can I have the partnership accounts? And then you suddenly get a whole bunch of spreadsheets. You take a quick look at it. Thank you very much. And then that's it. Like, What's the point? Go get an accountant to look at it. Tell you, does this make sense? Are they, are they hemorrhaging cash? Are they, are, are they managing in the right way? Um, because you know, if you once you sign up, you sign up to everything that comes with it. Practice premises, understand this. Like, is it a lease premises? Is it owned? Who owns it? What's the terms of the lease? Do I have to buy in or not? What's the end product? All these things are really important. And again, if I didn't think about any of this stuff, I just went into an interview thinking they'll ask me about, you know, what was an audit that you did. And and none of that stuff happened. It was all this stuff. And I, and I was just blown away. So one thing that I learned very quickly is if you want to think about partnership, you've got to do some research, you've got to know what to look at. Um, but before any of that, you've got to know whether partnership is right for you. And that's a question I think a lot of people have um, when it comes to that classic decision of partnership versus salaried versus locum. Absolutely. And th this is where organizations such as LMCs come in. They can help you look at the partnership agreement and provide you with advice regarding whether this partnership is something that works for you or not. So it's about being aware of the various organizations around yourself. Uh, and partnership, there's a lot of negativity around partnership, but that doesn't mean that partnership isn't right for you. I know that I know plenty of partners that are very happy in their partnership role and are actually achieving a good income as a result. So please, please, please look at the whole picture and put it into your own context and see whether it works for you. OK, what we're on to now, number nine, appraisal. Gosh, appraisal. Now, this you know, filled me with dread initially. Uh, actually, not initially. Actually, I'll be honest. I didn't even think about appraisal, to be honest. 
um, I was like, okay, well, who I've, I've finished training and, 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 and no more portfolio and, um, you know, done with all this reflection stuff. And, you know, that's kind of just what I thought probably like most people think. And then suddenly within a couple of months, I get an email saying your appraisal, your appraiser is this, um, and it's due on this date. And it just, I was like, what's this all about? And then I started looking into it and I realized that, okay, this is scary because, you know, you're getting someone who's assessing you, not again, as a trainee, but as an independent GP. And it, and it was a very stressful thing. But then when I went to my first appraisal, I realized that I didn't need to worry about it as much. Now, since then, I became an appraiser. So I've appraised many, many GPs who've had their very first appraisal. And I and I know just how worried they are when they come and see me for the very first time, or they used to come and see me, I don't do it anymore. But I know how stressful a thing this can be. But one thing I wanna put across is that you do not need to worry too much about an appraisal. It's not a pass fail thing like it is as a train in, in training. It's like your end of year assessment, right? Your ESR. It's like a, a pass fail thing. ARCP is a pass fail thing. Can you progress through training or not? This is not like that. This is supposed to be something that is there to help you develop as a GP. And appraisers are also appraised, so they're not going to put you through tougher time um, as long as the, the, the basic box are ticked. So an annual meeting between a GP and their appraiser. And the important thing to remember is your appraisal is looking at every role that you do that includes you being a doctor. Every role that needs you to be a doctor is covered in your, your appraisal. So initially, it's going to be mainly clinical general practice for most people for their first couple of appraisals. But some people are going to be doing aesthetics, for example. Some people might already have um, a diploma that allows them to do gypsy work. Some people might do out of hours work. And all these come as different roles that need to be put into your appraisal. So your job in appraisal is to show evidence that you are OK and up to date to work in all of these different roles that you've listed. So it's important to bear that in mind because all your assessments that you have to do, and a lot of these are going to be looking very similar to some of the stuff that you're doing right now, have to tailor into all of these particular roles. So for example, if you do a PSQ, because you have to do one PSQ and one MSF in every five year revalidation cycle. Now you've got to make sure that these cover all your roles. So if for example, you're a GP in a practice, two different practices, for example, in a week, you also do an out of hour shift. You also happen to do some minor surgery and you also happen to be on the local CCG boards. You need to make sure your PSQ, well not your PSQ, your PSQ covers um, patients from all of your different clinical backgrounds and your MSF covers colleagues from all of your different roles as well. So that's, that's a slight difference to what you do as a trainee, same kind of things here, but but different ways in terms of how you get that data. CPD on average, they say it's 50 CPD points per year. Now CPD is not just, I did an E-module, CPD is anything that you do that relates to you being a doctor. So it could be attending meetings with the CCG. It could be things like significant event analysis. They all go into CPD. So it's slightly different to what you do in terms of a trainee, in terms of your learning logs. But you have to get 50 hours of credit, basically, when it comes to appraisal once a year. You have to do all your SEAs, as always. You have to still do quality improvement activity. And there's a huge variety of different formats of quality improvement. And in the online course, we go through about 15 different types of um, quip that you can do, but audits still seem to be the one that most people still seem to do. Of course, you've got to declare all your uh, complaints and do a probity and health check. So that's the basic minimum that happens once a year when it comes to appraisal. You can't have more than three different appraisals with a single appraiser. So once you've done three in a row, so for example, I used to get to know people for three years and then suddenly they had to move on to somebody else. So um, you can get a maximum of three. You can defer appraisals for various reasons. And when you get to appraisal, these are the four, your appraiser will be looking at all of your evidence and thinking about these four areas to see, have you demonstrated that you have the evidence um, that allows me to show that you're okay to work in these various roles. So your designated body, your NHS area team basically will allocate you an appraiser pretty much pretty early on actually, but, but you're not gonna have to worry about it for, until about a year or so. When it comes around to your appraisal date, it's your responsibility to contact your appraiser, book the appraisal with them. You then do your preparation and you should be submitting your appraisal at least two weeks to your appraiser in advance. So it's an e-portfolio, basically like you're doing now. So e-portfolio doesn't stop, e-portfolio just carries on. So you should submit it 14 days in advance. Now, this didn't happen many times when I did appraising and I remember getting at least two or three appraisals the night before. So it happens, but it doesn't leave a good impression. So if you can get organized and get it in early, it'll be good. You then have your appraisal meeting either at the appraiser's place or at your practice or even in another place that's, that's convenient to both. It's not a pass fail like I think. It's just, it, like I mentioned, it's a supportive process 
where they look to see how are you progressing, how's your career moving. They'll give you some good good bits of advice. And if you're gonna have questions about careers, appraisers are super people to ask about because they've seen a multiple number of different GPs doing different things. So they should have some contact or some idea or some link that they can help you pretty much regardless of what issue that you may have. So like we said, CPD has got to be tailored to the whole scope of your practice. So not just about the clinical stuff that you're doing right now. And like we said, there's lots of other things that you need to put in. Uh, PDPs still have to happen. So you still got to do smart PDPs, but it's more kind of, okay, where do I want to go in the next year of me being a, a G, independent GP? That could be PDPs related to clinical stuff, but it could be PDPs related to non-clinical stuff as well. Like I want to, to, to get involved with the CCG. I want to learn more about LMCs. I want to think about how to become a trainer. Those are all part of your PDPs when it comes to being a GP, as well as your clinical stuff, like getting up to date with XYZ. And you still got to do reflection. You still got to, that doesn't stop either. Um, so you, but it's not going to be as strict as it would be in training. You know, I've got to say, and I saw, I, when I was appraising doctors, I saw a huge range of reflective capabilities. Um, but as long as you can show that, look, I've thought about what I did. There's a little bit of a, a bit of evidence as to what I'm doing differently now. Um, then usually that's 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 sufficient because it shows you've gone through that reflection process. So appraisals, please do not worry about them. Um, they're not there to pass or fail you. They can be stressful, but they don't need to be as long as you're prepared well um, and you understand things before you jump into it. Number 10, I had no idea how much and how quickly general practice changes. Now, if there's any evidence of this, it's been in the last three months. The whole way that general practice has run has changed probably forever in the last three months. But even when I came out of training and I moved into um, being an independent GP, all the stuff that I did as a trainee, within a couple of years, everything had changed. So you have to get really used to the fact that you've got to adapt. This is a, a system, general practice changes hugely every couple of years, and you've almost got to be open to the fact that this is going to change. So I'm just going to hand over to Peter to talk about some of the basic things that are changing at the moment so that if you have interviews coming up in the next couple of months, then just so you understand a few key things, and we go through a lot, lot in more detail in the course, but just as a bit of an overview here. Yeah, general practice is an ever evolving landscape and it's very important for you to understand that landscape because that will in turn affect your job. So contracts, contracts are so important. If you don't know when you're going to a practice, whether they're a GMS practice, which is the main type of contract that the majority of uh, practices hold, that's uh, your general medical services contract. That's what people refer to as the core contract. That's important because when it comes to applying for a salary job, um, you know, things such as they have to offer you minimum conditions based on the BMA recommendations if it's a GMS contract uh, practice. Um, the other two types of contracts you'll hear about are PMS, which are slowly being phased out. There's not many of them around and APMS contract. Now, APMS is also important um, because if it's an APMS contract, you could be a partner there and the contract could end next week. The problem with APMS contracts is that they're not stable. And that's why it's important to think about which contract that practice is holding in terms of Super partnerships, federations, PCNs. PCN stands for primary care networks. These are all words that will probably change over the next couple of years. Essentially, these are practices working at scale. So groups of practices working together. We'll go into more detail in the course, but you need to understand these because once again, if you're a partner in a super partnership or a federation, your role will differ to um, according to the agreement that's in place. And for salary GPs, that also makes a difference. Are you working one site or multiple sites? It all affects how things work. And that's why we need to think about these different forms of changing general practice. Some of you may have heard about the new offer that came out for partnership yesterday. It, so it's important to be up to date with all these changes. As we've seen in COVID, the format of consulting has changed. A majority have gone digital. You need to be up to date with all these changes. You need to know what to look out for. If you're going to start working for an online provider, what things do you need to be thinking about? Is there a good governance system in place? If it, when a complaint comes through, what system do they have in place? How do they investigate the complaint? Or are they actually going to chuck you in in the deep end because they don't have a good governance structure? These are things that you need to be thinking about. And these then in turn impact 
what role you're looking for as a GP. Are you wanting to be a GP that's a leader? Do you want to lead in terms of these organizations? Do you want to be leading within your practice? You know, what is your role? You need to be thinking about it. And it's not only salaried and partner GPs that can make an impact. The majority of uh, um, my roles in medical politics were actually when I was a locum GP uh, and I did less um, when I was a salary GP. So it's important to think about what role you're looking for as a GP and it may even play into your portfolio role. So these are things that you need to be considering and not to stress out too much because I'll guarantee you in the next couple of years, there'll be new changes and new acronyms for you to learn. So not to stress out when these take place. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't understand any of these terms when I first came in, and I still don't understand a lot of them now, but it's fine. You just got to get used to the fact that things change um, and you've got to adapt to what's in front of you. And Pooja made a really quick point there. If you think about salary general practice and you're going for a job and you're doing an interview, one of the, and you know when they say, well, well, any questions for me, ask, does this salary role tie me to one practice or is this salary role something that I can be changed at short notice between four or five practices that are in your organization? Very important question to ask. A lot of people take up roles and then suddenly within three weeks, they're like, well, tomorrow we're short in this practice, so you've got to go there. And they didn't really know about this. And then, well, it's in your contract and you know it was there for you to sign. And all these kind of things can suddenly backfire. So knowing these things and understanding these kind of things in terms of interview would be very, very important going forward. Right. So a really quick backup of the 10 things that I thought were really important that I did not think about as a C newly CCT GP. Guys, if, if you can um, tweet or Facebook this kind of picture or take a quick snapshot of it, we'd be really grateful um, just to show that you're on this webinar. What are the 10 things that I really picked up? I had no idea just how many GP types I could be. I had no idea how much I would feel out of depth. I had no idea as a locum how organization mattered a huge amount. I did not know how important accounting and financial advice would be. I had no idea how tough the days would be at some points. I didn't know I had to promote myself so much as a GP. I had no idea how important it was to network. I didn't know anything about partnership before I went for a partnership interview. Appraisal didn't need to be as worse than I thought, and I had no idea how much and how quickly general practice changes in a very quick period of time. If you are on social media, it would really help if you can tweet this or if you can take a picture and put it on Facebook and just tag either me or Pooja, we'd be really, really, really grateful. So at the end of the day, guys, it's all about choice. You have worked super, super hard to get to this point where you now have the ability to make choices. Like I said, some choices are forced on you. Some choices are ones that you can decide whether you want to make or not. What type of GP do I want to be in the first place? What are my working hours? What do I want to do? What do I want to give up in my week in terms of work? What's my working environment? I want to work here. I don't want to work here. I want to work in this type of practice, not in this type of practice. You have that choice. Who do you work with? It's up to you. Where you work, who you work with, your decision. What, what do I want to look at? Is it work-life balance? Is it life-work balance? What, what sort of balance am I looking for? And how do I tailor my choices around that? How do I develop myself? Like It's not just about me going in and doing my job every day. That's great, but you've got to be developing to keep yourself interested. What are your priorities? And they will change from day to day, week to week, month to month, depending on how life goes, and the choice to change if needed. Not everybody who starts a career in general practice ends a career in general practice. So you have the choice to walk away. You've earned the choice and the ability to make these choices going forward. I want to thank you guys so, so much for sticking with us. It's been a little bit longer than we thought. I hope we've covered some information that you have found of value and of use. You can contact us at any point if you have any queries going forward. We're going to stick around trying to answer some of the questions that we see now. If you need to go, that and I know we went over a little bit, so thank you for staying. If you want to stay around, then great. This webinar will be back on YouTube probably some point tomorrow, so you can watch it back if you missed any of it going forward. Thank you so much, guys, for your input. I'm just going to have a quick look at the codes because some of you have asked. We have uh two left for the online course so that's cct save 20 and we have one flashcards code available still left if you want to grab one of those before the end of the evening the codes are up here but thank you so much guys we're going to go a little bit silent because we're going to go start to go through the questions now um so please do put some more questions at the bottom if you think we can answer them for you but thank you so much to everyone else to leave